Now hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 5, 43 to 6, 4. If you're using a Bible underneath one of the chairs, it's on page 811 on the left side in the first column. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. We're beginning a new series today on radical generosity. While I was preparing for this, I noticed that this uh, last week, Time Magazine came out with their annual uh, 100 most influential people in the world. And interestingly, among uh, the various Hollywood personalities and political personalities, the kind of folks that you would anticipate seeing on that list along with scientists and the achievements that they're making was a, an athlete, an athlete from Houston, Texas, not being counted in that top 100 because of his achievements in professional football, but because of his achievements off the field. J.J. Watt is one of the most accomplished defensive players in the National Football League, playing for the uh, division rival, Houston Texans. Why was he noted in the top 100 most influential people in the world? Well, in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, which so devastated Houston this last year, he stepped up and sought to raise funds to help with hurricane relief. And his goal was to raise $200,000 to help people who were affected by that terrible storm. In the end, he didn't quite achieve his goal. In fact, he went well past it. He had 200,000, not dollars, but donors. And the total contribution that came in was $37 million. And so his remarkable leadership with this online campaign was noted. He offered himself as someone who could encourage other people to begin to participate in the kind of generosity which went to the relief of so many. Of course, that's something which resonates with us. We love to hear the stories of people giving away from themselves to meet real needs, to do the kind of research, for instance, that leads to cures for cancer or overcoming any number of different forms of human suffering. If you look at the Forbes list of top givers in the United States in 2017, you'll know a lot of the names. Names like Gates and Zuckerberg and Dell and Bloomberg. The top 50 most generous people in the United States contributed in excess of $14 billion to various causes and and human, areas of human concern across the country and across the globe. And every part of us goes, I'm so glad that those who were entrusted with those kinds of resources shared the way that they did. But sometimes, isn't it just the smaller examples of everyday generosity that grab our heart? I was reading last week about Elizabeth Jensen, a young lady in Provo, Utah, who was shopping for her wedding dress at Elizabeth Cooper Designs there in Provo. 
And she had this one dress in view. She was admiring it, really obviously liked it, but it was above her price limit. So she moved away from it, started looking at some others. But the attendant came over to her and said, is that really the dress you want? And she said, well, yeah, it really is. And she said, good, because another customer in the store today has just purchased that for you. And she began, of course, to cry and be happy. She was rejoicing at this anonymous contribution that was made to her life to make her life more beautiful. She was overjoyed. The rumor is her dad was even happier. When we read about generosity, whether it's to meet everyday needs or alleviate human suffering, there's part of us that rises up and says, that is so beautiful, that is so remarkable, yes, amen to that. And that's because whether you're a Christian or not, all of humanity rejoices in that kind of generosity. Why is that so? Why do people rejoice in generosity? We find that across humankind is the image of God. God is a generous God. God is, in fact, radically generous. God is the giving God. And when people give and when we see giving occur, there's that part of us that says amen to it is the echo of Eden, that we were fashioned in God's image, that we were made to be more than just people who acquire But we were made to be people who receive bounty and then share that bounty with other people. You see God's radical generosity, in particular in the Bible, in a couple of ways. God's creativity, his creation. If you read in Genesis 1, for instance, in verses 11 and 12, God says, it's very interesting, he says, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and Fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to their kind. And the earth brought forth vegetation and plants, each according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. And then on the next day, it says, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to light the day and light the night. You go, well, what's that got to do with with God's generosity? Well, see, when God said, let there be vegetation springing from the earth, God could have, I suppose, just said, let there be tree. There had been one kind of tree. Still would have been remarkable, still would have been beautiful. One kind of plant, one kind of vegetable, one, one kind of fruit. That's the way it could have gone, but it didn't. In fact, there are 391,000 different kinds of plants on the planet. Listen, there are 200 different species of potatoes. So many spuds, so little time. There are 700 different kinds of apples. There are 10,000 varieties of grapes. Thanks be to God. There are over 18,000 species of fish. There are 440 different kinds of sharks. Just when you thought it was safe to go back to the beach, you can remember that. There are over 60,000 different kinds of trees. There are 400,000 different kinds of flowers. If you go to the International Rice Gene Bank, there is such a place. You will find that there are 90,000 different kinds of rice. I I can't cook any of them. There are 10,400 different species of birds. There are 900,000 different kinds of insects. I've been bitten by 75% of them. There are are 150,000 to 400,000 platelets in a microliter of human blood. And if we look up, there are 100,000 million stars in our galaxy. And there are millions and millions of galaxies besides ours. And so whether we are looking at the created world through 
our irreducibly complex naked eyes or through a telescope or a microscope, we see the glory and the majesty of our Creator, His generosity. God could have said a tree, but He was not satisfied with that. In fact, God burst forth upon the scene with an extravagance, an overwhelming explosion of diversity and beauty. God is a radically generous God in creation, but also in redemption. Paul writes that we have received the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. And in 2 Corinthians 8, he says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. God bestows his riches, his bounty, his abundance on us in redemption. In creation and in redemption, we see God's extravagant, radical generosity. Why is that important? Well, it brings us back to the passage we just read a couple of moments ago in Matthew. Because in Matthew's gospel, this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says something about who the Father is, and therefore, because of who the Father is, who you and I are becoming. He says, you've heard it said... Love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And here's what he says. That you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In other words, one of the things that God is doing in making us his people is fashioning in us the family image. Who God is, is being shaped in our hearts. There's a forming that's going on in our lives so that our lives begin to look like His. We love as He loves. We forgive as He forgives. We accept as He accepts. And then Jesus begins talking about our own generosity, about how we give, because we give as He has given. Jesus says, here's how the Father does things. The Father sends sunshine on the just and the unjust. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. God pours out blessings after blessing on atheists who don't know to whom to say thank you. And he does the same for Christians who know but just don't. He just keeps pouring out more and more in radical generosity the effusive grace of his love. And what Jesus says is that you and I are called to be like him. You shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You go, well, that's never gonna, that's never gonna be the case. I, I, I can't be that perfect. Perfection awaits the return of Christ. It awaits our arrival in heaven. But between now and then, what the Holy Spirit is doing is forming the life of Christ, the image of the Father in our lives so that our hearts begin to reflect His heart and look like Him. God, you see, loved us when we were His enemies. We were God's enemies, Paul says in Romans, and yet God loved us to life. He loved us to peace. And that same heart that is radically generous in mercy, radically generous in grace, radically generous in accepting, that same heart is being cultivated in the soil of the soul of every person in here. The Holy Spirit is at work so that our lives begin to look like the radically generous heart of God. What does God's generosity look like? Let me give you just a few words this morning that describe God's radical generosity. Here's the first one. God's radical generosity is joyful. That's the first thing. It's joyful. In Isaiah 62, verse 4, the Scripture says that God will delight in you. God delights in you the way a young man delights in his bride. And he rejoices over you. In Zephaniah, the prophet Zephaniah, he says he will sing and rejoice over you. In other words, when God sees you coming to him, 
He rejoices to hear your voice. He longs for your presence. He created you for communion with him, and he delights in you. I know sometimes you may get tired of hearing God loves you. Okay, God loves you, but listen to this. God delights in you. When you call on the Lord, God never goes, Oh, I wish they'd text. <laughs> no, he answers. He goes, oh, look who's calling. That's amazing. I had an email this morning from a guy who lived across the hall from me at Hughes Hall, University of Evansville, in 1978. He thought of me and prayed for me and looked me up and sent me an email. Dr. Dr. Louie called and we got on the phone, and we were rejoicing together in shared memories that go back a long way, just after World War I or so. It's a long time ago. I was so happy to hear his voice. This fellow I'd admired, he was a few years ahead of me, and to hear his voice and to rejoice in it, God delights in you. You know, this comes through, this joyfulness in sharing life with us. This comes through when Paul talks about the kind of giving we are involved in. He says, God loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word that's behind that word for cheerful is where we get our modern English word, hilarious. Hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver, which means that if you want, when the offering comes by later, you can just laugh. But it's this sense of great delight. Oh, I love to do this. Like a parent loves to bestow gifts on, on their children. Look what I brought you. A grandparent sets before this child this thing that they've specially got in mind for them. There's great delight in it. Here's the second thing. God's generosity, God's radical generosity is not only joyful, it's immense. It's immense. You know, let's keep this wedding theme going as a young man uh, marries uh, uh, his bride, Jesus does his first miracle at a wedding, a wedding in Cana. And he shows up there at the wedding at Cana. And these are about week-long affairs, by the way. These weren't just afternoon things. Back in this ancient Near Eastern culture, weddings went on for about a week. And it was a responsibility of the bridegroom to provide wine. And they'd, they'd run out. Mary turns to Jesus and she goes, hey, hey, they've run out of wine. Now, I got tickled about this this week because I started thinking about what would have happened if Mary had called a church to say that somebody had run out of wine. How would most churches have responded? I mean, some churches would have responded, wine? <laughs> but still others might have said, well, 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 how much do you need? I mean, are you short a couple of bottles? I mean, we want to be good stewards after all. Uh, I mean, what, what's the real need here? Let's not get past the need. Well, Jesus fills up six stone pots with new wine fashioned out of water. And let me tell you, that's about somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. That's 780 bottles of wine. That should do it. <laughs> and it was, they said, the best wine. The very best. In other words, when God is generous to us, he goes completely over what is needed. God doesn't give just what is needed. He goes completely beyond what's needed. There is a superfluousness to what God does. It's just a sheer abundance. It's extravagant. This is the way God gives. God gives in immense ways. Let me give you a third way. Third word to describe God's, God's radical generosity. It's not only joyful, and immense. Here's another word. It's free. In Romans 8.32, Paul says, How will he who did not spare his own son, not with him, also freely give us all things? God's generosity has no strings attached. God just pours out blessing. On who? Matthew 5, the just and the unjust. To whom does he give rain? The just and and the unjust. With the Son, God freely, freely pours his love, his life, his bounty into us. God asks nothing in return. God is our Father, but he is not the Godfather. Some of you remember in the opening scenes in The Godfather, a man comes looking 
for some help from the Godfather. And he gets it. And he says, oh, Godfather, I, I will, I will I'll pay for this. I'll do whatever. And he goes, no, 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 no. He says, but, but uh, uh, I will ask a favor. I will ask a favor somewhere down the line. Okay. God meets every need we have, and he never goes, I'll get back to you. That's never the way it works. God just pours out his abundant supernatural love and grace in our lives in extraordinary ways. He shows his glory and his splendor. But did you hear how it happened? He who did not spare his own son, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Because all of these words, joyful and immense and free, are summed up in this last word, sacrificial. God's radical generosity cost him. It cost him. Listen to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God paid the price. It cost him everything. It cost him the pain of the cross. It cost him the humiliation of the incarnation. It cost him suffering and grief. Christ died on the cross for our sins. He bore in his body the penalty of our wrongdoing and freely bestows on us the gift of eternal life. Whoever believes, there's that immensity. There's that exultant, exuberant, joyful abundance. Whoever believes has the gift of eternal life. He gives his son. But that means, friends, to receive him, you have to admit your need. To be on the receiving end of God's generosity, to be on the receiving end of God's generosity, you've got to admit your need. I mentioned on Easter Sunday that Williamson County is the eighth wealthiest county in the United States. Well, I have to revise that. Last week, Forbes came out with their new list, and Williamson County has moved up to the seventh wealthiest county in America. And so in the midst of all of our affluence, it would be easy for us to be deluded by the gods of mammon into thinking we're fine. But Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are all those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. You know what? When you meet someone who has trouble loving, maybe it's they haven't received love. When you meet someone who has trouble forgiving, maybe it's because they haven't been moved by how much God has forgiven them. When I meet someone who has trouble with generosity, it's usually because they haven't understood how generous God has been with us. God is the radically generous God who goes to the cross and dies for us, who sacrifices everything because he wants us with him. He will pay any price. He will go to any length. He will invade hell itself to rescue us and make us his own. This is the radical generosity of God, and it is life-changing. It is cosmos-shaking. It is the kind of thing that unseats the devil and rescues and redeems imprisoned people. Every single person in this room needs, needs, needs the riches of grace, the radical generosity of Jesus. And when that gets a hold of you, when the joyful, immense, free, and sacrificial generosity of God gets a hold of your soul, you will find your life transformed. And you will love as he loves. You will accept as he accepts. You will forgive as he forgives. You will share as he shares. Because your heart has been captured by the generosity of heaven itself. Our God is the giving God, the generous God, and he loves you. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and pour that into our hearts.
Lord, see your servants as we stand before you. I pray that you would pour out by your grace, pouring your spirit into us. Come, Holy Spirit, and take out the selfishness, the narcissism, the egocentricity, and help us to look up and see how generous with us you've been. Spirit of God, come and show the generosity of the cross. Write it on the tablets of our heart. With it, renew our minds. You are the generous, the radically generous God. Grant us today a revelation of that. Grab us with that, God. Grab us with your generosity. Change us by your generosity. Do that, Holy Spirit, even now. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, our heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Dear friends, listen, all those names, Zuckerberg, Dell, thank God for them all. Thank God for Bloomberg. Thank God for Gates. Thank God for all they gave. But none of them became poor to make you rich. None of them gave up their home to bring you to heaven. But Christ gave up his home in heaven to make his home with you. Christ laid down his life. He gave up everything to make you his own. And if you haven't yet received him, I invite you to do so. Receive the one who has loved you to life. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Lord, now we come and we worship you in our giving. You are the giving God. You have given to us in overwhelming ways. Help us now to worship you in our giving through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's be seated together and worship God in our giving today. Amen. Let's all stand together. How many of you are glad the Lord has given his life for you? Amen. Thanks be to God. Whew. Glory to God. The generous, radically generous giving God has given his life to you and he gives his life, he gives his life into you with these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's uh, sing and rejoice as we go today.